Suddenly, the teenager received a message from Park Seo Young on his phone. John Woo was shocked. The messages came one after another. They said that So Yeon saw that the teenager had read her message and finally appeared online. Yeon Woo couldn't believe that everything had happened so quickly and that the girl had noticed it right away. So she followed their chat. Han Shang Yu noticed the shocked expression on the teenager's face and asked him what had happened. Yeon Woo looked up, asking what he meant. Han Shang Yu asked if the teenager had received a text. And then he asked if it was Park Seo Young. A smile appeared on my classmate's face. John Woo denied it, but his reaction betrayed a teenager. Han Xiong Yu started laughing at his classmate and reached for his phone, saying that he didn't believe Yan Wu. The classmate stood his ground, asking for a phone to look at it, and helped Yan Wu because he said he was an expert in this area. But the teenager looked at Han Xiong Yu and refused him with a ruder tone and expression. My classmate realized that he had overreacted and apologized. The events moved to the men's restroom. It was John Wu. He hid there out of sight and opened the message from So Young once again. The girl continued to write to him saying that his father was very worried and asked him to get in touch with her. Yeon Woo seemed to want to call, especially to see his father, but he just couldn't. He was very sorry, he knew that his family was worried, but he was to blame for his mother's death. Meanwhile, So Young was sitting alone on the stairs, staring at her phone, waiting for a response. Suddenly, something shocked the girl. She exploded and even screamed. Everyone else turned and looked at her in shock. Soyeon apologized, saying that her alarm clock had gone off. But her expression betrayed the deception. The girl moved a little further away immediately. The others paid no more attention to her. It turned out that Lee Yong-woo had written to her. He said he had charged his phone but asked her not to tell his father anything. Soyeon could not believe that it had really happened and she had finally received an answer. She continued to write saying that Yeon Woo's father was very worried and asked where the teenager was. The boy replied that he was in Cannes with Han Xiong Gyu, and then he asked to keep this secret from his father. Jean Vu was laughing at himself. He realized that he could not just keep running away from his father, but he had to find a cure and then meet with his family and the others. It was very difficult and painful for Jean Vu, but he decided to cheat him one last time. After all, if the teenager does nothing, everyone could die because of him. Meanwhile, Soyeon received a notification on her phone. She was shocked by what she read there. Lee Yongwoo said he couldn't go with them because he had a job right now. So Young didn't understand what other work he could have at that time. Meanwhile, the others stood at the top of the stairs and didn't even pay attention to Soyeon. She was just looking at her phone and trying to understand what was happening. Meanwhile, Yongwoo was going down the stairs to the boys for another assignment. Suddenly, he received another notification on his phone. He picked it up to read it, but realized it was from Soyeon. In it, the girl asked Yonwa to think carefully again. She wrote further that his father would not give up until he found his son, and he continued to run away, risking his father's life. The man in Choi ordered the teenagers to stay put while they themselves were going to inspect the area. Seon Young was indignant that they were leaving them there. Soyeon recalled that John Woo had told her about it himself. Before he could find himself, he had to survive this hell. John Woo decided to write that it would be better if they all returned home. Suddenly, Park Min came up behind Seo Young and said that he needed a phone charger. The girl jumped up, and this reaction surprised the teenager. So Yeon gave herself away that something had happened. She was a very bad liar. Park Min asked why the girl was so scared, but her answer betrayed Seo Young even more. Kang Min was sitting on the stairs next to her, listening in. Park Min asked Seo Young what she was hiding if she was shaking like that. Behind the whole company was Kang Jehoon. The teenager looked back and surveyed the area out of the corner of his eye. Sung Yan noticed this. She shouted to Kang Jehoon and asked where the teenager was going. He replied that he also wanted to look around. Sung Young shouted indignantly that they were all ordered to wait in place, and Kang Jehoon asked her not to shout. Park Choa silently watched what was happening, and then she yelled at Kang Jehoon to wait for her. The girl began to walk down the stairs commenting that it would be better to look around together. Kang Min was next to So Young, and he said out loud that it might be better for him to come out too. The girl looked at her classmate, but he did not respond in kind. Then he looked at me, smiled, and asked me what So Young thought. Meanwhile, it was raining outside. The weather was terrible. Isuri stood alone with her head down. She thought about that conversation with So Young. Isuri's girlfriend then told her not to worry, because she was not going to ask her to go with her. And then she asked if Isuri would leave them again and run for cover. 
The girl was angry that Park Seo Young decided to hurt her like that. Sung Yeon looked out the window and resented the fact that the men had been gone for a long time. And then she said that if she met Yeon Wu, she would scratch his face all over. Suddenly, Seong Young said something about Park Seo Young. Isuri told her classmate to stop repeating herself. And then she came back and asked me what Seon Young meant when she referred to So Yeon as Yeon Wu's friend. Meanwhile, the teenagers walked through dark corridors. So Young asked Kang Min where he got the flashlight. The girl was sincerely happy about it, saying that it was the most important thing they had. Kang Min turned to his classmate, smiled, and said that he still had a lot of things in his bag, so So Young could call on him. And then, the girl suddenly remembered that she wanted to give them something. She began to rummage through her bag in search of something. Kang Min looked at the girl and thought that she was infected. But he decided that Isuri was mistaken, because it was not some other person. It was So Young. Then Kang Min handed the thermos to the girl. But So Young didn't understand what it was at first, and asked again. Kang Min explained and said that she would need hot water. She was surprised, but thanked me. And then she looked Kang Min in the eye, saying that she preferred the cool water. Then a classmate addressed Soyeon by name and said that he trusted her. She did not understand what he meant, but reciprocated. After that, Kang Min's voice changed and he said he would ask her directly. And then he asked Soyeon to answer him honestly. He started from a distance, saying that the girl was looking for Yonva because she hadn't seen him for a long time. Then he paused for a moment. He asked if it was because Soyeon was infected. The girl said that Kang Min was right. She asked him how he knew and then, pausing between words, said that she was infected. She apologized, saying that she did not mean to deceive them. Kang Min was shocked, but So Young continued and said that this was not why she was looking for Yeon Wu. He interrupted her, saying that he understood everything. She asked him how he knew and then if he was surprised. So Young thanked him for being honest with her. And then she added that Kang Min was a very good friend who always knew how to support others. And then she told him not to worry because Soyeon assured him that she was fine. Kang Min was silent and did not speak. The girl then asked him if he wanted to come back, because his classmates were probably waiting for them. But the guy didn't want to leave. He asked if Soyoung was looking for Yeonwu because she was his friend. And then he said that the girl was not that close to him. Soyoung then turned back and looked at Kang Min. The teenager said that if this was not the case, did she have some other reason? Soyoung was shocked by this sudden question and the look on Kang Min's face. Meanwhile, events moved to another exit. Kang Jihoon was there, coming down the stairs. It was raining outside, and it became even more dangerous. Kang Jihoon sat on the stairs and thought about something. The teenager looked at his hand and could not believe that there were no more virus cells on it. But the guy still didn't feel well. The virus was in his body. Park Choa came up behind me and asked if the effect of the medication had passed. Kang Jihoon was even a little scared of the girl who kept following him around. The girl said she was going to follow him and hit him if Kang Jihoon left without telling Park Joa. And then she asked if the teenager was also afraid to walk alone. Kang Jihoon objected, and then asked why the girl was following him all the time. She said she was just passing by and was going to rest on the stairs for a while. Kang Jihoon asked if that was all, to which Park Choa asked what the teenager was doing alone and if he was thinking about his mother. The guy asked if he looked like a crazy person and why he had such thoughts. And then he said that it was not Park Cho's case. After that, Kang Jihoon suddenly opened up, even his voice changed. The teenager went on to say that he suddenly thought that in the past, Lee Yong Woo must have felt lonely when he was alone. Park Cho said she did not expect the teenager to speak there. He said he didn't expect it from himself either. Maybe it was because he almost died. Suddenly, there was a silent pause and everyone was thinking about their own things. And then Park Cho said that if you think about it, it was full of contradictions. She went on to say that Kang Jihoon said he wanted to repay the rescue, but now he wanted to leave alone. And then, Park Choa looked up, looked at her classmate, and said that he had no choice because she had saved his life. So the teenager had to follow what she said. Kang Jihoon just said that it sucked and there was no point in it. After that, the teenager abruptly stood up and Park Choa asked why he thought so. Meanwhile, events moved to Park So Young and Kang Min. The girl was standing alone, leaning against the wall and looking at the floor. She was holding a lantern that a classmate had given her and was lighting the floor with it. Soyeon looked very sad and lost in thought. She thought about her conversation with Kang Min. The girl did not understand what her classmate was hinting at, what other reason he wanted to hear about. Seo Young was angry because she thought that Kang Min suspected her of seeking out Lee Young Woo because of his power. 
She got angry and started yelling, saying that she just wanted to help her friend. Kang Min interrupted Seo Young, saying that he had already told her that he believed in her. He went on to say that he did not suspect the girl of her intentions, but believed that she was doing it with good intentions. Suddenly, the teenager paused between sentences and looked Soyeon straight in the eye. The girl was wary, but answered in kind. Kang Min said he wanted to know how Seo Young felt. She asked what her classmate meant. Kang Min looked down ashamed. He asked if Soyeon remembered. The situation that happened in a shelter for the homeless when the military came to pick them up. When everyone was fleeing through the window, Soyeon was hesitant and just stood there. Kang Min said she was left alone for Yan Wu's sake. Soyeon was shocked by this statement, wondering why her classmate was even thinking about it. Suddenly, she started to panic and asked why it was strange, because she just didn't want to leave Yan Wu. But she suddenly stopped and changed the subject to Kang Min. Soyeon asked what it had to do with him, why he was interested in how the girl felt. Kang Min was silent, as if he was gathering his strength and thoughts. There was a silent pause. Then the teenager began to speak. Soyeon looked him straight in the eye. Kang Min responded in kind and said that he just wanted to help her. Events returned to reality, where Seo Young sat on the floor alone, thinking about what Kang Min had meant. The classmate wanted to know how she felt because he just wanted to help her. She suddenly wondered if her behavior was considered excessive in the eyes of others. If you think about it, could she have just absent-mindedly said that the reason, the reason she was looking for Jonah was out of his hands? Soyeon didn't want to look like that. She didn't like to look like a coward in the eyes of her classmates, someone who could be betrayed. So Young was so absorbed in her thoughts that she didn't notice Park Min approaching her and brazenly reading the girl's phone. He asked since when, and Soyeon jumped up in fear. Park Min grabbed the girl's phone roughly and asked her since when the two of them had been in contact and called her names. The guy read their correspondence out loud and swore. The teenager acted very mean. He continued to read everything, although he had no right to do so. So Young tried to grab the phone out of his hands, but Park Min held it by force. And then the boyfriend came back to So Yan and said that they had promised not to betray each other, and the girl said that she was on his side. He clutched So Yan's throat, and she tried to say something, even scream, but she couldn't. She yelled for Park Min to give her phone back. His gaze became crazy, and he just threw the girl aside as if she were some kind of object. So Yon flew away and fell to the floor, screaming loudly in pain. Park Min looked at the girl and scolded her. Suddenly, someone shouted and asked what happened to Soyeon. It was Isuri and Kang Min. The guy was screaming and aggressively asking what happened. Soyeon told Park Min that it was her personal thing, something she felt. The girl kept going, no matter what the guy told her or didn't tell her. Moreover, Park Min seemed to have forgotten her warning. She asked what Park Min was thinking. When he met Lee Yong Wu again, he really believed that the guy would just keep quiet. Seo Young came close to Park Min and asked what the teenager could have done without her. After all, the only one who needed help was himself. Park Min called So Young again and asked if she had threatened him. The girl abruptly snatched her phone out of the boy's hands and confirmed his opinion, adding that the teenager should take care and not touch her again. Park Min called her a bitch and ordered her to be quiet because the little boy was very annoyed. Meanwhile, Kang Jehoon quickly ran to his classmates and called out to them. He was shouting for everyone to run away as fast as possible. It seemed like something terrible had happened. It turned out that there were a lot of monsters outside who were gathering together. There were soldiers nearby, but it seemed that they could not cope with such a large number. There were an abnormally large number of monsters, as if someone had deliberately called them. Others watched them from the window. It seemed that the monsters had come straight out of the Han River. The soldiers could not cope and decided to just run away. The forces were not equal. The company was watching from above, and it made their blood run cold. Parkman also stood with everyone at the window and watched what was happening. The teenagers realized that the soldiers outside could die. Yon Wu's father said that they all had to get out of here first and ordered them to wait in place. Xiong Yong was indignant that her husband wanted to save those soldiers. He replied that he could not pretend that he had not seen it. Choi said that he was going to leave as well, but Yan Wu's father told him that there was no need. Park Min stood alone and did not pay attention to what was happening. He realized that it was all the work of Lee Tain, the guy with the red hair. Suddenly, the teenager remembered something he had read on Soyeon's phone. John Wu wrote to the girl that he had a good idea and that she was right. The teenager's father ordered Choi to take all the children to a safe place. Park Min recalled Seo Young's words that the man was in danger. 
The boy realized that if John Wu's father was really in danger, his son would definitely come to his aid. Meanwhile, the events moved to the room with the monsters. There were many poor people lying on the floor, unable to cope with life and drowning everything out with substances. Next to him was a guy holding the cells with his bare hand. The main man was sitting on the couch and said that he had been attacked by many people before, but this was the first time. When someone brought a phone with them, the boss said he was very embarrassed. John Wu said he brought medicine, but it didn't help. Then the teenager told the chief to try it, and he would either be cured or die. Yan Wu was getting closer to the boss and did not let go of the monster. Then the boss stood up and laughed, saying it was a strange feeling. He thought it was a threat. The chief asked why Yan Wu was being so cruel and ominous to him. He added that he would have to tell him. He said that the point was to perceive monsters as demons. Then the boss put his hand on Yanva and advised him to memorize it well. Suddenly the teenager had an epiphany. He realized something. He turned to the chief and asked again. Meanwhile, Han Xiong Yu and Nuna were hiding behind the stairs. The girl asked what happened to Yan Wu and why he suddenly got angry and went upstairs. The teenagers argued with each other about who should go upstairs to see John Wu because it seemed that the boy was spreading the virus. Nuna tried to persuade Han Xiong Yu to go to her classmate. Then the teenager suggested that they just leave Yonva and go down because if they went upstairs they would die. Suddenly Nuna said she was going upstairs, and Han Xiong Yu exploded and ran first because he couldn't trust her. They carefully opened the door to the room. Inside were guards and others who had been infected by the monsters. Nuna stood in a shocked stupor and did not understand what was happening. John Wu asked what the boss meant when he said that the flesh was healed. He said that they were essentially making cells that were addicted to psychotropic substances. If monsters become addicted to substances, they will not infect people. This way, no one else will get infected. The chief continued that based on all that had been said, it could be called an antidote. Then John Wu began to speak. He said that the man had deceived him and was going to attack the man. The boss started screaming and panicking, saying he wasn't done yet and had a plan in mind. John Wu said he knew about this so-called plan. They wanted to cook meat that would be poisoned with psychotropic substances. The nuclei that have not penetrated the body will come out of it, and then they will sell it. And that's why the chief got rid of the long-haired thug. The boss looked down and said that he understood why John Wu thought that way about him. But the teenager knew nothing about him. The boss claimed that he really didn't like dirty things like these cells. He told Yang Wu to think about it. Even if the boss sells the cell nuclei, the distribution won't affect him. He went on to say that people like the teenager didn't care because they were immune, but the main thing was tired of the cells. After that, the boss looked Yong Wu in the eye and told him that they were distributing drugs along the Han River. The teenager also looked him in the eye and did not like this information. His family and friends were in danger on the Khan River. Yong Wu came closer to the chief and asked what he meant. The man said that despite being pushed back by the presence of soldiers, they always watched the Khan River. And looking at the cells that were controlled by drugs, they realized one thing. Their nervous systems are closely interconnected. The boss laughed and said that he thought Yan Wu probably knew about it too. He explained that he noticed that if one monster liked a substance, the others around it also reacted. After that, they experimented and learned that after some contact, they shared their feelings with each other. They concluded that the answer was the Han River. Because there are a lot of cells there, the chief told Yong Wu to think about it. One of the monsters got out of the water and stood on the pier. Then he saw a monster that was addicted to substances behind him. The chief continued that the surrounding cells would also quickly become addicted to psychotropic substances. Yong Wu said the man was always looking for profit in everything, so he couldn't trust him. The chief said he was serious. Suddenly he heard screams behind him. He turned around and saw Han Xiong Yu and Noon being beaten by the guards. The chief continued that he knew that John Wu must have lost a lot, but in the end, the substances could be obtained again. And then the boss asked me if everyone died, who would he sell them to? Yan Wu looked at this man with no morals and asked how he could speak such low words. He only said that it was because he was addicted to psychotropic substances. He added that since Yan Wu already knew everything, he suggested that we stop there. And then he asked if the teenager wanted to save his friends and asked how John Wu thought why he left them alive. The teenager thought that he had realized that these addicted monsters just wanted another dose and that the main man was not treating people with substances, but simply using them to create monsters. Even in the Khan River, this bastard got there too. Yan Wu looked at his feet, and there were virus cells near them. 
Then he asked the chief when he was going to the Khan River. Meanwhile, behind him, the man was attacked by monster cells. Yan Wu stood in front and did not react to it. Then, the teenager told the chief that he didn't have much time. They looked into each other's eyes, and John Wu said that his father was waiting for him. The guards and men standing behind him asked if the teenager was mocking them. Suddenly, the boss ordered his men to get ready, and then he poured a drink and repeated that Yan Wu had said he didn't have much time. Then he said he wanted to have a drink first, and asked the teenager if he was a high school student. Then he suggested that we finish with these people, and then they would return more quickly. The man in black asked the boss where he was sending them all. The chief turned and asked where he could go if he had to go there while the person was invulnerable. And then he looked at Yonva. He said he had to go to the damned Khan River. Meanwhile, terrible things were happening there. The monsters chased the soldiers, and they ran away as fast as they could. Their numbers and strength outnumbered the military, so the men had to run away. Some still tried to shoot back as the monsters continued to pursue. They only fought off some monsters by setting everything on fire. I heard the shouts of a new party behind me. The soldier said he was starting to go crazy because there was another one behind him. Then, soldiers opened fire on these monsters from all sides. It seemed to work and the monsters were burning alive in the fire. The soldiers stood bravely and burned the damned monsters. But it was harder to fight sea monsters because they were resistant to fire. The commander told his teammates that they had failed because the monsters were still attacking them. He was about to tell them that it was over. Suddenly, the man noticed something up ahead. They were shouted from the window to come to them. They were called into the room. The commander said that the screams seemed to come from this building. That was John Wu's father shouting, telling the soldiers that he would help them all. The man was worried because he wanted to sincerely help the military and enlist their support. He wondered if there was any other way, so he looked around. Suddenly, Yan Wu's father saw something that could be useful to him. Meanwhile, Park Choa and Isuri stood on the stairs and looked down at what was happening. Kang ji -hoon was with them, rummaging through his briefcase and saying that they were wasting too many Molotov cocktails. Kang Min looked down and thought that the problem was not only with cocktails. What was worth checking was whether there were any other mutations. Suddenly, someone called the teenager and he was a little scared. When Kang Min turned around, he saw that it was So Young. She seemed to have come to talk to the teenager. So Young started the conversation for Yonwa, saying that she was thinking about him. She said that at first, she felt very guilty. After all, Lee Yonwu helped her, but Seo Young just threw him into Namsen. Kang Min defended her, saying that at the time, she just had to do it. Seo Young continued that somehow the situation became clearer. She said that they left Yonva there and she could not forget the teenager's look. He was so lonely. And when So Young found out that Lee Yanwu was alive, she felt happy. And after the teenager was so cold and rude to her, So Young became attentive to his every move. She just couldn't calm down. And then the girl paused. After that, she said that her heart was hurting because of Yanva, and she was sincerely sorry for the boy. And then she summarized that, in any case, many mixed feelings made her so confused. So Young asked what those feelings were and added that she would like to know. And then she looked down and said that she could probably find out if she met Yan Wu and asked if Kang Min could help her with this. Meanwhile, it was raining heavily outside, and it seemed like it had been raining forever. Yan Wu's father came up with a plan. He opened a window and tried to lower something like a fishing rod into it. He also climbed out of the window and shouted at the soldiers to get up quickly. The military agreed to this rescue, but they humbly climbed this invention. When the men finally got there, they fell to the ground and started laughing loudly. Yan Wu's father asked what was happening outside and if any of them were hurt. One of the soldiers stood up and said that they were safe because of him. But it seemed that one of the soldiers was worse off than the others. He could not get up from the floor and was shaking. John Wu's father noticed him and realized that it was dangerous. He put all the children in danger. Meanwhile, the teenagers ran to the others to make sure they were okay. But they were met by soldiers with machine guns. The men ordered the teenagers to stop and stand still. One of them politely asked the children to follow their instructions and asked how many people were there. Yon Wu's father asked the soldier to wait and asked why he had suddenly become like this. But in response, and as a sign of gratitude, he also received a muzzle directly in his face. The soldier politely, but in a commanding tone, asked to follow the quarantine rules. And then they said that people who did not wear protective clothing would be quarantined and those who wore it but without a mask would be restricted. Xiong Yong was indignant and whining as usual, and Kang Ji-hoon asked if it was because they hadn't been checked at the quarantine site. 
They said that people who wore protective clothing had to be checked, for example, in a refugee camp. Sion Young continued to be indignant and asked who saved these stupid soldiers. Suddenly, someone yelled at the girl. One of the soldiers shouted and asked what Song Yon had just said, because she had to know who they were suffering because of. Yon Wu's father yelled at the soldier, who was acting like a rude man, and said that there was no one infected, put himself in charge, and asked him not to point the weapon at the children. The soldier said that they also had no choice. He turned to the man, thanked him for saving them. But they still had to be careful, because no one knew who could be infected. Then the man paused, and then he said that from that moment on, they all had to be honest. Then he asked them to raise their hands if anyone had any symptoms. These include nausea, headache, fever, or similar symptoms. No one raised their hands and just waited to see what would happen next. The soldier asked if they were sure no one was infected. Then he asked if any of them knew anyone who was acting strangely. Kang Ji-hoon stood next to Park Choa, and then she looked at her classmate. But everyone was silent. The soldier then told the children to be smart and speak honestly while they had the chance. He tried to intimidate the teenagers by saying that they would be punished if any of them were infected. Sung Young quietly told Kang Ji-hoon to speak up quickly because he might get them into trouble. Isuri said she was stupid because if any of them were infected, they would all be quarantined. The soldier repeated once again that they should all be honest. Suddenly, Park Choa stretched out her hand to Kang Ji-hoon. She wanted to take it. The teenager looked at his classmate out of the corner of his eye. The girl did not do so in return. She looked straight ahead. Then, Yon Wu's father yelled at the soldiers, reminding them that he said he was in charge and ordered them to stop threatening the children. He asked how he would benefit from saving the soldiers if they were infected. Yon Wu's father continued that they were just young children who had just entered high school. It seemed that the man was not just covering for these children, but was speaking sincerely and about what was hurting him. He went on to say that all of these children had come a long way to get here and had experienced a lot without anyone's guidance. Then the commander gestured for the soldier to lower his weapon. After that, he asked the man if they were the only survivors of the building, to which he said that there were several other children and one adult. Then the commander said that they would first inspect the building from the inside and ordered the rest to bring the other survivors. After that, someone shouted at someone and ordered them to put their hands up. It was Kang Min and So Young. They were scared and didn't understand what was happening. The soldier asked if they were friends and then ordered them to raise their hands and come closer. Suddenly, one of the soldiers noticed something strange. He asked Soyeon about her cap. Meanwhile, the soldier was holding two pendants with personal information. After that, he took off his protective mask and swore. He was standing by an open window. Suddenly, we heard monsters screaming from there. The man looked down and saw that the monsters were attacking the man in a group. He immediately took out his weapon and opened fire on the monsters. When he took a closer look, he noticed that there were soldiers there, and not just one. The man got angry. He was just burning with aggression, and said that he would kill all the monsters right now. Suddenly, one of the monsters turned to the soldier, and it seemed that he was angry with him. Meanwhile, another soldier was dealing with Soyong and Kang Min. He was interested in a particular girl, and asked if they could talk. The soldier asked where Park Seo Young got the cap from and if it was hers. She didn't know what to say, because she didn't want to give Yonva away. The soldier said that they were looking for a guy wearing a branded cap and were interested in where Soyan got it. The girl immediately realized that something was wrong, so she decided to lie, saying that it was her cap. Then Sung Yeon interrupted the conversation, telling Soyan not to cheat because it was Lee Young Woo's hat. The soldier heard this and asked if it was her friend's cap after all. He asked if it was her cap. Soyeon tried to justify herself further by saying that she picked up the cap and it became hers. In her mind, she was cursing Sion Young. Behind her, Kang Min was screaming and worried that something had happened. The soldier then asked if the person who had owned the cap earlier was also in the room. So Young said that Lee Yongwu was not here, and they all did not know where the boy was. Suddenly, something terrible happened. We heard screams and shots. It turned out that monsters were climbing out of the window and the soldier was shouting for others to help them shoot back. More and more monsters climbed. They gathered together and climbed the wall together. The soldiers stood together and opened fire on the monsters, trying to protect others and themselves. The teenagers were not at a loss either, and Kang Ji-hoon ordered everyone to make and take out Molotov cocktails. He was running with his briefcase and pulling out his weapon on the run, telling everyone to wait. Suddenly, the teenager felt sick and he had experienced this condition before when he was infected in church. 
Kang Ji-hoon fell to the floor and screamed. A soldier was standing right in front of him and might have noticed something. The teenager did not understand what those feelings were, but it seemed that he was dying. It seemed as if nails were being pounded into his arm with all their might. Did he really relapse? Suddenly, someone ordered Kang Ji-hoon to run away. The teenager looked up and saw that the monster had already attacked the soldier. Soyeon was also going to run away from monsters and from an unpleasant conversation. The teenagers ran away, turning back screaming. Suddenly, a soldier grabbed Park Seo Young's arm. He said that they were high school students who came on a field trip, and the man knew it. He went on to say that the teenagers were the ones who appeared on the live broadcast on the bridge. The soldier started shouting, saying that Soyeon must have known where Yeon Woo was. Meanwhile, other soldiers were burning monsters. Suddenly, the soldier grabbed Soyeon by the shoulders and said he wanted to ask the girl for something. The soldier said he needed John Woo's help. He wanted the teenager to find the troops on the Khan River. The number of soldiers fighting the monsters at the window was growing. Soyeon asked what the man meant. He had to go and help his comrades. There was little time. The man told me to go there and then find any military personnel. They would understand if So Young told them the identity of John Wu. After that, the soldier ordered the girl to hurry up and went to help fight the monsters. Kang Min grabbed So Young's hand to make her run away as well, but she could not leave the military man in her mind and kept coming back to him. The man joined his brothers in arms and destroyed the monsters, but the ruthless monsters continued to advance. The military decided to retreat. But what to do with those people who are simply trapped on the other side of the room? There was a military man sitting there, shaking with fear. After all, next to him, the monster was eating his fellow soldier and he was next in line. The poor man was screaming and begging for help. Suddenly, there was a loud sound and he abruptly opened his eyes and looked at his partner. The soldier held his weapon very close to him. Something terrible happened. Meanwhile, Kang Min and Park Seo Young were running down the stairs and heard an explosion. The girl looked back and froze for a while. Kang Ming noticed his classmate's anxious state and stopped as well. He asked Soyeon what was going on, and she asked why they weren't here. Kang Min grabbed his girlfriend's hand and yelled at Soyoung to wake up, because they couldn't worry about anyone else. He said that they promised that they would find Yanwa together. But why did they all have to survive? The rest of the teenagers came down from above, screaming. Isuri screamed and told me to try to do something with this scale. And then she asked if anyone else had seen the exit and what happened to it. But no one had made it yet. Sung Yong was running behind me and screaming, and Park Choa ordered her to shut up. Otherwise, she threatened to slap her. The girl was loudly recoiling and whining that everyone was accusing her. Then Park Choa asked about Kang Ji Hoon, because when she looked around, she couldn't find him. So I decided to ask my classmates if he was not with them. Meanwhile, upstairs, in the room where everything was on fire, someone could hear moans. The events took place near the exit. Kang Jihoon was there, holding onto the door and loudly laughing. It was very difficult for him. His strength was leaving him. He realized that something was wrong with him. Everything happened just as he thought it would. It was not so easy to get rid of the cells. Suddenly, someone asked Kang Jihoon if the effect of the medicine was weakening. The teenager looked up and saw Park Min approaching. He asked if the teenager felt pain and cold sweat. Kang Ji-hoon responded by swearing and asking where he had been all this time. And then he asked, without waiting for an answer, whether Park Min had the same condition. But the guy just called Kang Ji-hoon stupid. He said that he was taking medication secretly from everyone and that he would be fine for a while. But Kang Ji-hoon will start mutating. The teenager replied that if that was the case, he had to go and help the others. Kang Ji-hoon said that Yeon Woo's father helped the army stop the monsters to buy some time. Park Min asked about Yeon Woo's father. After that, the teenager grabbed the door of the room where Kang Ji Hoon was. The teenager abruptly stopped them and asked Park Min what he was doing. Kang Ji Hoon was holding them and shouting, which was why his classmate was closing the door. Park Min was silent and only shouted back at the teenager to let go of the door. Kang Ji Hoon looked the bastard straight in the eye and said that he thought he was his friend. But Park Min responded by asking what kind of friends they were supposed to be and punched Kang Ji Hoon. The teenager had little strength, so he fell to the floor. After that, Park Min scolded his classmate and kicked Kang Ji Hoon. Then he shouted that they were not friends and kicked the poor man in the face. He asked all the time why Kang Ji Hoon thought they were friends if the boys wouldn't talk to each other after graduation. And then Park Min said that the classmate was just a lower caste person who pretended to be strong, so he couldn't live like a human being. After that, the teenager looked at Kang Ji Hoon with a smile and told him to try to ask him for medicine 
and if he took it seriously, he would give it to him. Kang Jihoon looked up and looked at Park Min. His ugly rat face, which only knew how to attack the weak, was begging to be slapped. Then, Kang Jihoon called Park Min a bastard and gave him the middle finger. Meanwhile, someone came running to the other teenagers. It was Park Min, and everyone was asking him where he was. He told them that it was over, because it looked like Kang Jihoon and Yan Wu's father were stuck upstairs. When Park Cho heard the news about her friend, she was immediately alarmed. Park assured everyone that he tried to help, but he failed. And the situation was very chaotic because of the monsters. Everyone heard some strange sounds on the other side of the door. Park Min continued and asked if there was any way to tell Lee Yong Wu that his father was in danger. Meanwhile, Kang Ji Hoon was still on the floor where the fire had occurred. The teenager was getting sicker and sicker from the smoke caused by the fire and cursed Park Min, who locked him in the room. Suddenly, Kang Ji Hoon felt something. Virus cells began to appear on his arm. Next to him was a soldier who was being devoured by a monster. The man tried to get out from under its paws and tentacles, but could not. Kang Ji Hoon watched what was happening carefully. The teenager noticed a flamethrower lying next to the soldier. Then he decided to take it to have at least some protection. Meanwhile, it was raining outside. A black car was driving fast on the road. Inside was the boss, his bodyguards, and Lee Yong Wu. The chief was indignant that the road was bad. The guard told the boss to look inside because there were many abandoned cars. It was leading to the fact that they would not be able to drive a car because of this. Meanwhile, Yan Wu was looking down and thinking about something else. The teenager held a phone in his hands and kept looking at the screen as if he was waiting for a message. Nuna was sitting next to him, also looking at Li Yang Wu's phone. Then the girl asked if the teenager was expecting a message. She went on to say that Yan Wu had almost run out of juice on his phone, so he had something more important to do in that situation. The teenager turned to Noon and said it was none of her business. She said in response that John Wu should not forget that he had to protect her. Suddenly, something happened outside. Even the boss noticed it. There were many monsters in front of their car. They were all hostile to them. Then Li Yong Wu got out of the car and just tried to use his powers of control. The chief asked him if these monsters were from the Han River. And then he said that there were too many monsters. So the boss asked if it was okay if he didn't help the teenager. But if Yun Wu needed a weapon, he could give it to him. John Wu said that everything was fine. The chief asked if the teenager was going to show everything he was capable of. Li Yong Wu said that he felt the monster's feelings even though he did not touch it. The chief was shocked by this. The teenager looked the monster straight in the eye and mentally ordered it to die. The monster opened its mouth because it wanted to attack, but stalled. The other monsters followed the monster's fate, and then Yon Wu ordered the chief to look at it. Then he said that he did not need a weapon. Suddenly, I heard screams from the other side. The monsters were running away from a huge monster. It looked different from the ones that came out of the Khan River. The boss said it looked like a mutated monster and added that he was curious to see how Yon Wu would handle it. The teenager did not panic and just looked at his opponent in silence. The monster roared, opened its mouth to pounce on Yonva. The boy stood in his place, but it seemed that everything was going differently than with the other monsters. Then he ordered the chief to give him a weapon. A few minutes later, everything was on fire, and even the rain did not have time to extinguish it. The mutated monster was also on fire. There were guards with guns standing nearby, and one of them said that the smell was like grilled squid. The men finished their work and packed back into the car. Suddenly, Yan Wu received a notification on his phone. When he read it, his blood froze in his veins. It was a message from Park Seo Young saying that his father was in danger. Meanwhile, the man was really not doing well. All the soldiers were devoured by monsters, and he was the next in line. Suddenly, the man opened his mouth wide, because he did not have the strength to scream, but he was scared. It was all because the monster opened its mouth wide and was about to pounce on Jonah's father. The man screamed he realized that his end had come. Suddenly, someone attacked the monster. Yun Wu's father did not even have time to react. He just covered himself with his hands. It turned out that it was Kang Ji Hoon. He fought the monster with his bare hands. The man was shocked by what had happened. The teenager asked his father to tell his son. Kang Ji Hoon paused for a moment. And then he said that this time he had repaid his debt to Li Yong Wu. After these words, Kang Ji Hoon opened fire on the monster that was so close to him. 